This is the New Yorker Fiction Podcast from The New Yorker magazine. I'm Deborah Treisman, fiction editor at The New Yorker. Each month, we invite a writer to choose a story from the magazine's archives to read and discuss. This month, we're going to hear Disguised by Isaac Bashevis Singer. Tamerl herself was about to faint, yet she noticed that the woman's cheeks were not smooth but fuzzy, as if she were sprouting a beard. Disguised was published in The New Yorker in 1986. It was chosen by Nathan Englander, author of the novel The Ministry of Special Cases and the short story collection For the Relief of Unbearable Urges. His short stories have also appeared in The New Yorker. He joins me in The New Yorker office. Hi, Nathan. Hi, Deborah. So Singer wrote literally hundreds of stories and dozens of them were published in the magazine. Why did you instantly go to this one? You know what? I'll I'll admit it since it's so intimate, just me and you and whoever's downloading, but... I knew I wanted Singer from the start, and then I picked 87 other stories as well because I thought, like, <laughs> I'm so Jewy, don't be Jewy. And I think everyone gets penned in in these weird ways. Stories are about people, and why he breaks free for me is he's such a wonderful mix of two worlds. It's such a New York story and such a steadle Singer's destroyed Yiddish world story. And I think, I don't know, he weaves the two so deftly, and it feels like the story is from, you know, 1902, but it's it's from the 80s, and I feel like... I feel like it's his his present world mixing with the world of his imagination in such a sweet, sweet way. Have you been reading him all of your adult life? Yeah, I mean, it, he was a huge influence on me, absolutely. I mean, I remember, I remember finding him. It was when I was in Jerusalem the first time, but I remember reading, you know, the family must get and and these massive multi generation million character novels, and then and then finding these stories. But yeah, it was it was just. Having grown up religious in a closed world on Long Island, you know, I love Roth and I love Mal and it, but all these guys were, it was about being American. And I felt this is a feeling that I have that I don't lose that I feel in his work, which is someone from a very close, it's, it's a world cracked open. You know, I can feel his excitement of being out in the world. And I sort of feel that too. There was just, I, I felt a very deep connection. And also, I mean, we can talk about craft as well. His, his wonderful utterly deceptive simplicity fascinates me. There's a writer and then there's a narrator and then there's the magazine that you pick up and then there's you reading. But the real stories are the ones where that all falls away, where it's just told to you. And I feel like he's, you know, a maestro when it comes to that. We'll talk more after the story. Now here's Nathan Englander reading Disguised by Isaac Bashevis Singer. When Tamaril stood under the wedding canopy, she surely did not know that in less than half a year she would be an abandoned wife. Tamaril was the daughter of a rich man. Pinchas, or Pinchasel as her husband was called because he was small and slight, was a poor yeshiva student. He received a large dowry from his in-laws and was promised ten years board. Tamaril was good-looking. Why would anybody want to run away from her? But a few months after the wedding, Pinchasel was gone. He stealthily packed a few garments in a bundle, took his prayer shawl and phylacteries, and left the town on foot. Even though he could have taken the entire dowry, he took only three silver guldens. No, Pinchasel was not a thief, and neither did he chase women. He barely looked at Temeril when he lifted the veil from her face on the wedding night. Why, then, did he run off? Some people thought he was homesick for Komarov, where he had been brought up, and yearning for his mother and father. But even his parents heard nothing from him after he left his wife. Someone had seen him in Zamosh, someone else in Lublin. After that, there was no trace of him. Ben Chassel had vanished. People expressed all kinds of opinions. Maybe he had quarreled with his wife. Maybe he disliked the town where his in-laws lived. Perhaps he wanted to make an end to the Jewish exile and return to the land of Israel. Even so, he didn't need to run away. He could have divorced Temeril, or at least sent divorce papers with a messenger. To walk out on a Jewish daughter is a grave sin, because unless she is divorced according to the laws of Moses and Israel, she can never remarry. Temeril sulked and wept. It would have been much less of a misfortune had he left her with a child, but he left her with nothing but an ache in her heart. The women questioned Temeril. Did he come to your bed on your pure nights? Did he speak gently to you? Did you ever resist him? From Temeril's answers, it was clear that they had behaved more or less like man and wife. As far as the family knew, the night before Pinchasel left, he read a Talmudic book in the study house until late. There was no sign on his face that he was preparing to do anything unusual. 
but in the middle of the night as Temeril slept, he packed up and slipped away. Why? And where to? His parents and father-in-law sent messengers to look for him in the neighboring towns. The family wrote to rabbis and to community leaders across Poland, but Pinchasel had apparently managed to elude everybody. There was only one explanation. The demons had captured him. But if the demons capture a man, he is not spotted in Zamosh and in Lublin. They drag him behind the black mountains where no people walk, no cattle tread. Some women murmured that perhaps Pinchasel harbored hatred toward Temeril. But how could anyone hate Temeril? She was a mere 17 years old with a silky smooth face, dark eyes, and slender limbs, and she seemed to be utterly devoted to her husband. She had sewn an ornate prayer shawl case for him and sent to him as a wedding gift a velvet matzah cover embroidered with golden threads and with his name in little gems. If he dallied too long in the study house, she sent her maid to call him home to lunch. Rumors spread that a young man who looked Jewish had been seen in a procession of priests and monks at a cloister, but this certainly could not have been the learned and law-abiding Pinchasel. People often say that one cannot understand the ways of the Almighty, yet the ways of human beings can be just as perplexing. Two years passed. Pinchasel's parents and in-laws had searched far and wide. They inquired in every city or village where a Jew might settle. One day, Temeril surprised her parents by telling them that she had decided to go and comb the earth herself in search of her husband. Her mother, Bela, cried bitterly. How could she allow her 19-year-old daughter to wander over the world? Where would she go? Where would she stay? Bela was terrified that the same fate would befall Temeril as had befallen Pinchasel. But her father, Reb Shlomo Meltzer, had another viewpoint. It was not unheard of for an abandoned wife to set out in search of her husband. It had happened more than once that the wife finally found the man and got a divorce from him or else located witnesses to his death. What did Temeril have to lose? Her life was ruined either way. Reb Shlomo gave his daughter money and sent along a maid to help her in all her endeavors. The maid, a widow, was a distant relative of his. A long journey began for Temeril. She did not travel with any specific plan. She followed all possible leads. If she was given the name of some town that the messengers might have omitted, she found a vehicle and traveled there. Wherever she went, she sought out the rabbi and the community leaders, and she visited the synagogue and the study house. She searched in the marketplaces, along the side streets, in the poorhouse. She asked if anyone had seen or heard about a certain pin hustle. People shrugged their shoulders, shook their heads. Pinchasel had no outstanding traits. He looked like an average young chassid. When he forsook her, he had not yet begun to sprout whiskers, but by now he probably had grown a little beard. Wherever Temeril and her maid went, they heard the same refrain, go look for a needle in a haystack. Months passed and Temeril pursued her search. Traveling all over the Lublin region and farther into the so-called Great Poland matured her before her time. She gained the kind of knowledge that comes from staying at inns and listening to all sorts of talk. She met with other abandoned wives. Men did disappear. Once in a while a woman too disappeared, but those were rare cases. Tamaril learned how vast the world was and how odd people could be. Each human being had his own desires, his own calculations, and sometimes his or her own madness. In the city of Chelm, she heard, the daughter of a rich Jew had fallen in love with a pork butcher and converted to Catholicism. In Yaroslav, a wealthy businessman divorced his wife and married a prostitute. In Lemberg, they imprisoned a charlatan who had 24 families in 24 towns and villages. Temeril also heard many tales of people who had been carried away by hobgoblins, of children captured and enslaved by gypsies, and of men who escaped to America where, she was told, it was nighttime when it was daytime in Poland and where people walked upside down. There was also talk about a monster who was born with a gray beard and the teeth of a wolf. But Temeril somehow felt that Pinchasel had not been seized by demons, and that neither was he lost in faraway America across the ocean. Temeril journeyed through all the Jewish towns. 
The money that her father had given her ran out, but she had her jewelry with her and was able to sell some of that. She had written to her parents, but they could not answer her since she never stayed long enough in one place. In time, the maid became weary of roaming and she returned home. For Temeril, wandering had become a habit. In one town, she met someone who resembled Pinchasel. She alerted the community leaders and he was taken to the rabbi and later to the ritual bath. But certain marks on his body did not coincide with Temeril's description. He did not have a black nail on the big toe of his left foot and he did not have a wart on his neck. He denied having been born in Komarov and swore that his name was not Pinchasel, but Moshe Shmerl. He admitted that he was married and the father of children, but said he had not run away from his wife. The opposite was true. His wife refused to live with him because he could not provide for the family, and he had gone out to look for a teaching job. The rabbi and the elders believed him, and Temeril was sentenced to pay a fine of 18 groschen for suspecting the innocent and giving a stranger a bad name. Temeril traveled as far as the city of Kalish, and there she was passing through a marketplace when her eyes caught sight of a woman who seemed strangely familiar. Where have I seen that face before, Temeril wondered. The woman was buying eggs from a merchant and holding a basket into which she put the merchandise. There was nothing unusual about all this, but Tamaril stood there gaping and could not move from the spot. Suddenly she realized whom the woman resembled, no one else but Pinchasel. Am I losing my mind, Tamaril asked herself in bewilderment. She remembered being fined the 18 groschen for false accusations. At that instant, the woman glanced at Tamaril and seemed to be so shaken that she dropped her basket, breaking many of the eggs. She attempted to run, but the merchant ran after her, calling that he hadn't been paid for the eggs. The woman stopped and began to look for money, but her hand was trembling and the coins fell from her purse. Temeril herself was about to faint, yet she noticed that the woman's cheeks were not smooth but fuzzy, as if she were sprouting a beard. Also, her hands were too large for those of a female. A wild thought ran through Temeril's mind. Perhaps this is Pinchasel dressed up like a woman. But why would a man want to parade around like a woman? It is forbidden by the Mosaic law for a man to wear the garments of a woman and vice versa. The woman picked up the fallen coins and paid the merchant. She then began to walk away quickly. She was almost running and Tamaril ran after her, screaming and calling her back. The woman stopped short. Why are you chasing me? What do you want? she asked in Pinchasel's voice. You are Pinchasel, Tamaril cried out. Instead of denying it, the strange woman stood there pale and speechless. Finally, she managed to ask, again in Pinchasel's voice, What are you doing in Kalish? I'm looking for my husband. It is you, Tamaril exclaimed. You left me an abandoned wife. In her dismay, Tamaril began to choke and cry spasmodically. The woman looked at her and said, Come with me and she pointed to a muddy alley strewn with garbage and pools of slop. There, after attempting to quiet Temeril, the strange woman admitted, Yes, I am Pinchasel. Why did you run away? Why did you dress in a woman's clothes, Temeril howled. Are you mad, possessed by a dibuk? What are you doing here in Kalish, and for whom were you buying eggs? Are you someone's servant or slave? Are my eyes deceiving me? Am I dreaming? Or am I bewitched? God in heaven, the terrible misfortunes that have befallen me. Temeril began to sway and was about to collapse into a swoon. She clutched at Pinchasel's shoulder and a horrifying shriek came out of her throat. In fear of attracting attention and having a mob of people witness his disgrace, Pinchasel blurted out, I know that this will shock you terribly, but I live here in Kalish with a man. With a man, Temeril gasped. Are you fooling me? Are you joking? What do you mean with a man? Yes, with a man. His name is Elkanah. We met in a yeshiva years ago. Here we bake pretzels for yeshiva boys. This is how we earn our living, and for this I went to buy eggs. Forgive me, Temeril, but I never wanted to marry you. I was forced by my parents. That is the real truth. Whom did you want to marry, Temeril asked. Him. They stood motionless for a while, then Pinchasel managed to say, I can't help it, I must confess the whole truth. 
What truth, Tamerl exclaimed. What did you do? Have you, God forbid, forsaken your faith? No, Tamerl. I am still a Jew, but... Penchussel stammered and shook. He again dropped the basket, but he did not bother to pick it up. He stood before her ashamed, frightened, pale, moving his lips, but unable to utter a word. Then Temeril heard him say, I'm not a man anymore, not really, not for you. What are you saying, Temeril asked. Were you sick? Did some vicious people do something to maim you? No matter what you tell me, I'm still your wife and I must know. No, Temeril, not this, but speak clearly. Temeril, too, was trembling and her teeth chattered. Temeril, come with me, Penchussel both ordered and pleaded. Where to? To my house. I mean home where we live. Where is your home? Who is this we? Did you find another woman? No, Temeril, but don't lie to me, I beseech you. In the name of God, oh, I'm afraid. Pinchussel started to walk ahead, and he motioned to Temeril to follow him. As they walked, Pinchussel was saying, According to the Talmud, when a man is overcome by the evil spirit and knows of no way out, he should wrap himself in black garments and go to a place where he is not known and do what his heart desires. This is what we did, Elkanah and I. They came to another alley into a shabby-looking house. Pinchussel urged Hemeril to come inside, but she refused. He pulled her by the arm, but she stood firm. After much hesitation, she gave in. Luckily, Elkanah was not home. There was a clay oven in the house and a kneading board. The place smelled of yeast and firewood. Temeril imagined that she recognized some of Pinchussel's books in the bookcase. A ladder led up to a loft bed. Pinchussel invited her to sit down. This was no longer the modest, bashful Pinchussel she remembered, but a worldly man who reminded her of the adventurers described in the storybooks she used to read before she married. Pinchussel offered her some of the pretzels he had baked and a glass of soda water. He repeatedly apologized for his sins and the suffering he'd caused her and her parents. He even joked and smiled, something he never did in former times. Temeril heard herself saying, "'Since you seem to regret your sins, perhaps you could repent and return to God and even to me.' "'It's too late for that,' Pinchussel answered. "'I can regret but not repent.' Those who are trapped in our net can never escape. And he quoted the book of Proverbs, None who come to her return, nor do they reach the paths of life. Shocked as Temeril was, she heard him out. She told Pinchussel that there was only one redeeming act for him, and that was to divorce her and free her as quickly as possible. Pinchussel agreed immediately, but said that the divorce could not take place in Kalish, where he was known as Elkanah's wife. You could have done this from the very beginning, Tamerl reproached him, and spared me all the misery I went through. We know that we will be punished, and we are ready for the fires of Gehenna, Pinchussel said. Passions too are fires. They are Gehenna on earth, perhaps the gate to hell. Meanwhile, come, let us have a glass of tea together. Tamerl could not believe her own eyes. Pinchussel served tea with jam for her. They were sitting and drinking like two sisters. He was saying, My parents had hoped to have grandchildren from us, but certainly not through an outcast like me, who would be excommunicated by the Jews and hanged on the gallows by the Gentiles. But you, Temeril, will soon remarry and bring your parents all the joy they expected. I wish you good luck in advance. You are utterly mad, but thank you just the same, Temeril said. That evening, when Elkanah came home, a tall, handsome man in a short coat and a silk vest, his black side locks curled in ringlets, he was told the whole story. While Pinchussel still spoke with the humility of a Jew, Elkanah proved to be like one of those who were referred to in the Talmud as profligates for the sake of spite. He denied the existence of God, of providence, and the holiness of the Torah. He went so far as to suggest that Temeril should get the divorce papers from him, Elkanah, in order to save Pinchasel a costly trip. Temeril asked Elkanah, Have you no fear of God at all? He answered, All I ask of Pinchasel is for him to come back soon and continue to bake pretzels for the yeshiva boys, some of whom I have managed to seduce. 
and he winked and laughed. Some weeks later, when Bela was sitting in the kitchen with her maid, plucking Goose down for a feather bed, the door opened and Tamaril entered. It was snowing outside. An icy wind rattled the shutters. Bela let out a wild cry of joy and jumped up from her stool, and all the down on her apron fell off. The maid lost her tongue altogether. Even before Bela could greet and kiss her daughter, Temeril announced, Mazel tov. Here are my divorce papers, written by a master scribe, signed by two kosher witnesses. That was almost all she could tell that day and for many days, weeks, months, and even years after. The real story, with all its peculiarities, Temeril could not tell because Pinchasel had made her swear by God, by the Pentateuch, by the lives of her father and mother, and by everything holy to her, never to mention any details as long as she lived. All she could say was that she had found her husband somewhere and had got her divorce. The entire story was told to a rabbi and to the elders of the burial society many years later, when Tamaril lay on her deathbed and was reciting her confession, surrounded by her sons, daughters, and grandchildren, as well as friends and admirers from the region where she lived to a ripe old age. There were many demands and temptations for me to break my oath of silence, Tamaril was saying, but thank God, I kept my lips sealed until today. Now, after all these years, I am free and ready to tell the whole story, since the place where I am going is called the World of Truth. Temeril closed her eyes. The women of the burial society had already prepared the feather to hold under the dying woman's nostrils to see if she was still breathing. Suddenly, Temeril opened her eyes and smiled, as the moribund sometimes do, and she said, Who knows? Perhaps I will meet this madman once again in Gehenna. That was Nathan Englander reading Disguised by Isaac Basheva Singer. It was translated by Devora Menash, who became Devora Telushkin and was Singer's assistant for the last decade or so of his life. The story appeared in The New Yorker in 1986 and is included in Collected Stories, One Night in Brazil to the Death of Methuselah, published by Library of America. The impeachment of Donald Trump was only six months ago, which is hard to believe. And this week on The New Yorker Radio Hour, I'll talk with Jeffrey Tubin whose new book, True Crimes and Misdemeanors, covers the long process of the Trump investigation and where it went wrong. Plus, a conversation with Mayor Lori Lightfoot of Chicago about the federal agents who've been sent to her city to fight crime. That's the New Yorker Radio Hour from WNYC Studios. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. So, Nathan, when you think of Singer's general territory and subject matter, the the life in these Polish-Jewish shtetls in the, the turn of the last century... Cross-dressing, transvestitism, gay marriage, these are not the first plots that would jump to mind. <laughs> no. So what, what do you think inspired this story for Singer? Well, you have to not remove the person from the place. Like he's living on, you know, 86th Street. This is the 80s. Like, I mean, he was at the cafeteria on Broadway, not at Studio 54. But they, he must have been aware of the world around him. And I thought he's seeing this all. And it's, you know, I, I just thought it was a wonderful way to enter the mind. But then I want to contradict myself. Because the other thing is, I love that idea of real worlds. A failed story is a sensational story. It's the sensational idea executed. You know what I'm saying? It would be too cheap to be like, oh, look at this, you know, a transvestite chassid. But the point is, it's very human. What I found so lovely is he says her in the story. Mm-hmm. You know, when sweet old Pins Russell speaks, he doesn't say him. It's not Singer coming in and it's not the community coming in. He's chosen to be a woman now. And Singer, it's such a quiet thing. It says her like three times or she. It took me one second. I was like, good for you. Like it yeah. is respect. Yeah. So you think that he took something he knew of in New York and transposed it back there? Or you think maybe he knows it actually was going on back then? Do I know that this happened? Of course it happened because everything happens. Yeah. You know, every generation thinks they invented, you know, sex and adultery. And this is the first, you know, it, it's I, I'm sure it had probably not every day. Yeah. Oh, you know, a lot less than now. <laughs> well, sex is a, is a constant theme for Singer. Yeah. But it always it's never sex by itself. It always pulls on the on the moral issues and the religious issues and the cultural issues. Yeah. Well, he's talking about morality, but he's not preaching. I guess. I'm teaching this semester. I don't teach that often, but I can't say it enough and scream it at them enough and keep stressing enough. Like, I think writing is a moral 
act in a deep way. Not that writers can't be immoral. You know, I say you can eat a eat a bowl of babies for breakfast. I don't talk. I'm not talking about day to day morality. Like writers, we are a corrupted, you know, debauched bunch. But the idea is, you're like everything has to be in place when you tell story. And I feel like he was a, a deeply moral man when it comes to story. And I think that's it. The the weights and measures of the story. It's just perfectly balanced. You know, when we were talking about. Jewish, not Jewish. I, stories function on so many levels, and they're for different readers. And I love that this one, if you know your halacha, if you know your Jewish law, this thing is so tight. What is pushing the story forward? A woman without a divorce contract cannot remarry. And that's what she needs. So I also like that. You know, she doesn't mind keeping the secret for him. She doesn't mind protecting him. She didn't go back and ruin his name. I mean, he caused her a great amount of pain, you know. She didn't go to page six with it. Like, it's just... Between she's taking it to her deathbed. Well, I mean, the, and the nice thing about the story is he commits this serious transgression, and everybody ends up happier because of it. He ends up happy. He's in a happy marriage with his, you know, manly boyfriend. <laughs> it was and, hysterical. <laughs> That's I also lo- I like this one moment. Like I just like this Eva. Like and I seduce the boys. I seduce the yeah. Eva boys. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's an excellent added non thing for this debonair. Yeah. It's interesting to me how. Singer sort of leaves open the question of whether the marriage was ever consummated. You know, she answers all those questions, and the result is that they had behaved more or less like man and wife, but not entirely. Do you think that they did? No, I think not. <laughs> I mean, that's what I also love about truly closed community. I mean, I was talking to a, a friend who was Hasidic but is no longer. But uh, see, this is where I get stories from. But I'm just interested in that idea, like people who they find out the girl's woman's not getting pregnant and they find out they've been doing it wrong for years, <laughs> you know? And I was like, that just amazes me, that level of naivete and stuff like that. Like people still, you know, obviously people in clothes, they need to be told on the wedding night what's going to happen. But yeah. Yeah. sometimes it's not properly diagrammed. So yeah, I would right. say in this story, there's probably not consummation. Singer wrote a lot about disguises. Obviously, he wrote Yentl, the most famous disguise story about a girl disguising herself as a boy to go to the, the yeshiva. He also wrote often about demons and and so on, disguising themselves as various things. What do you think pulled him into that sort of fictional trope? My feeling and my guess is that it's not fictional in a sense. You know, it's that idea where we say, like, I'm an atheist, but a failed atheist, you know, this sort of Woody Allen setup. And I feel like if you, you know, had the pleasure of cornering Singer somewhere and getting to ask him, he would be a modern man who knows that there aren't these things, but also be someone who deeply believes in them. And I think that's that weird mix of your childhood head and your grown up head. And so I'll steal this from something that Lethem said, but uh, Donovan said, you know, why isn't Kafka science fiction? And it's because it's a fully realized world. And exactly that, why isn't this genre fiction? And, and I think it's because it is a fully realized world. And I kind of think that might come from the fact that that's how Singer sees the world. Now, Singer called once called Yiddish the wise and humble language of us all, the idiom of frightened and hopeful humanity. And I've heard people say that in Yiddish, his stories are sort of more verbose and sprawling and inflected, and then the English versions are tighter and more controlled. Do you feel like the Yiddishness comes through in translation? Uh, the Yiddish feel, absolutely. I mean, it's it's just funny. I mean, I didn't get raised in Yiddish, but even just being taught by you know, spending my whole childhood in yeshiva, I had to learn, it was when I was in grad school, my own Robinson to teach me to put my sentences back in order. Like I should wait all day here for you to show up now, you know, be like, no, I've been waiting all day for you to, sh-. and I'd be like, oh, unpack some of that, you know, like, could you translate these to English? So I feel like, I mean, he, I, again, as I understand, he worked really closely with these translators, but I think I consider the English not a translation of, I consider it sort of a joint mm-hmm. project. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like any of the the sort of Yiddish inflections come through in your own work? I mean, it goes back to the, you know, your beginning question of, again, me admitting like, oh, I better pick someone. I, you know, there's, yeah. you know, plenty of Gentiles to there's, choose there's, from in a hundred years no of Europe. having influence. No, but it was that <laughs> idea of like just feeling this deep love. But I, I, well, I think it was just, again, you know, we're talking about him, not me. But I felt after this first book, like, oh, I have to have a book, you know, no Jews in the second one. And it was just this, this weird thing that I'm, you know personally critical of but applying it to myself it took me a long time to finally accept and understand like you what a complete universe it is and what it is to have a certain universe in your head so i I, yeah i kind of feel like there's sort of a it's strange but this i hear sort of a yiddish speaking tiny old man you know i feel like if that's the voice you know if those are the stories getting told then tell those but i can't really there's no (laughs) excuse for it 
You know, when I was um, doing a little reading in preparation for this, I saw somewhere that um, one of Singer's favorite writers was Edgar Allan Poe, which Love that. surprised me. Um, That's nice. I mean, That's he, funny because they live right. Uh, Singer lived on 86 in Broadway yeah. and Poe lived on 84th in Broadway. Well, apparently Singer had read him in every language he'd been translated into. And, and then I, it, I thought, well, maybe that's where he gets the sense of these very short tales, some of them supernatural, some of them not, but the, this sort of compacted form. I, th- I think this is a nice thing to hear about reading when you ask people their phrase exactly like we always break, you know, we just this need to constantly categorize. But it's that really is sort of heartwarming to me to think of him reading Poe and stuff. And, and going back to it yeah. over and over and loving those stories. Um, Singer was was very popular here for many years, especially after he won the Nobel. Do you think that he had a lot of uh, a large effect on other writers? Again, what they can't see at home is me aging rapidly in front of you. But like, <laughs> I just wonder if you get caught in a time like it's so strange. Who are my writers? You know, as I mentioned, teaching now, I'd be like, these are the stories you must read because these are the exact stories I fell in. Like, you must now read Lawns by Mona Simpson and the things they carried. And you know, here's Bullet in the Brit. Like, these are the stories that made me love stories. So I wonder. You know, I'm, I'm not sure the shift of time. Like, are, are people reading Carver today? I still love Carver. Are people reading Singer today? So I, I really, yeah, wonder how time is shifting. Yeah, to me, he's this huge, huge presence. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nathan Englander's novel is called The Ministry of Special Cases and is published in paperback by Vintage. You can find many previous fiction podcasts at newyorker.com or in the iTunes store. You can also download the weekly audio edition of the magazine through iTunes or Audible.com. The New Yorker Fiction Podcast is produced by NewYorker.com and Curtis Fox Productions. I'm Deborah Treisman. Thanks for listening.